We're going to have a deeper discussion about something Anna Kelly called for probably six months ago, and that is stagflation. We're going to talk about perhaps crash up and what might that look like. And we're going to close with opportunity because we're going to talk about some potentially scary things. But I want my audience to realize where there is great fear, there is great opportunity. How are you doing, Anna? I'm doing great. And I think if you go back and listen, Michael, I'm pretty sure at the end of 2022 is when I first started saying, I'm pretty sure we're heading toward stagflation just based on, you know, history yeah. of looking at the, the 30s and 40s and looking at the 70s and 80s. This was kind of my fear that we were going to have stagflation. And again, you know, for those of for those that want to say tune us out and say you're doomers, right? Mm. We we have to be realistic about what we're seeing in the economy and what's coming. And mm. where there's pain is always where there's great opportunity. So if you listen to us talk about these things and just say, oh, that you know it's doom and gloom, I'm not going to be helped. You're missing some of the greatest opportunity that might be in your lifetime. And I really believe that some of the opportunities we are going to see are the best in my lifetime or close, especially in the commercial market. Mm -hmm. um, but where there's opportunity, you have to recognize the opportunity through the risk and be able to say what's coming. How do I mitigate risk in order to take advantage of that opportunity so that I'm not catching a falling knife, right? Because if we're blind to what's really going on and think it's all sunshine and roses, ahead, then we're not going to see the risks that we need to med mitigate. And, and it could end up, you know, going in at the wrong time at a peak, you know, being one that's wiped out because you didn't know what was coming. And instead, I think both of us have built risk by being able to say what's going on in the economy, where is there the greatest pain? Therefore, there is the greatest opportunity. Now, how do I take advantage of it wisely um, and make good decisions? So, yeah, I, I love this topic, and I do think that we are heading for some stagflation. And I, I, you know, get a little bit of satisfaction of, of the fact that now some of the big dogs and big yeah. heads of banks and you know financial institutions are finally saying, now we don't see soft landing, we see hard landing, and maybe even stagflation for a couple of years. So oh, I, yeah. I think that that is the right call. I think that we're we're in for that for a few years. Um, but again, many kind of things can happen in the economy that can change that. It's just a matter, and maybe we can talk about what things could ch what what stagflation is. Mm -hmm. why we see it coming and and what things could change it and get us out of it. Oh, we're going to do all of that in this episode. I just want to quote again, not being a doomer. I want to tell you what Blackstone, Blackstone, I consider Blackstone the best real estate investing organization on the planet. That's where I've kind of put Blackstone. Yeah, Blackstone REITs. Sees, yeah, REITs. Uh, generational investing opportunity ahead in commercial real estate. That's yes. what's coming. Uh, I do believe, and, and Jonathan and I have talked about uh, another commercial real estate investor on the channel, that there's going to be a tremendous opportunity coming. But let's go back and talk about stagflation, because you are absolutely right. You are the first on this channel, the first in any media that I consume, and I consume it every day, to even hint that stagflation was possible. And you're absolutely right. I think that was a call late 22, perhaps early 23. So you were, you were quarters ahead of anybody else. Um, congratulations. Why don't we define what it is and then talk about why it is particularly nasty? Sure. So essentially, in layman's term, it's a stagnated economy at the same time that price inflation is up. And so, you know, generally we think of market cycles as, you know, peaks and troughs. And so you have the peak and then generally, you, you know, you, the economy gets overheated. You do end up generally with some inflation and then the economy, you know, falls off a cliff. The Fed does what they do, you know, to to try to uh, to, to keep the rally going and then to keep the recession from being too bad. And what most media, you know, pundits have basically said is, when are we at the peak and when are we going to have a recession? And, you know, the, the timing is really difficult to get right. You know, I'll pat myself on the back for the stagflation call, but I also thought we would go into a quick, deep recession much more quickly than what, what we have. And that hasn't happened yet. And so timing is really hard to, to see and to get right just because of how complex our financial system is. But essentially, there are periods in history where rather than a clear peak and a huge drop off and a trough, you have an economy that just kind of goes sideways. It stagnates. And so you don't have a lot of growth. 
um, at the same time you have inflation. And so what happens is generally, the reason the Fed likes this 2% inflation mark is because generally they can't get GDP above about two without a bunch of government spending. And so mm -hmm. they try to keep gross domestic product production incomes, et cetera, above where inflation is so that everybody can feel like they're ahead of inflation a little bit. OK, well, what happens is when you have gross domestic, when you have GDP not really going up significantly above inflation, even if inflation is kind of coming down and stays around where it is, if if production can't increase much higher than that, you have this stagnating economy that's like struggling to produce, struggling to create um, sales and income at the same time that inflation has not come back down. And so that period where both of those things are true can last quite a while. They don't happen real often, but as central banks do more and more to, to try to keep you know, things level, um, they're getting closer to the stagflation, stagnation, if you will, than a true peak or a, a true deep trough, you know, recession-like condition. And what's challenging about that, Michael, is that the Fed's primary tools are two things. One is manipulating rates, and two is the money supply. How much money are they going to put in the system? How much money are they going to take out of the system? And essentially, when an economy is already at a bottom, so let's think of 2008, 2009, 2010, for example, the Fed needs to stimulate out of a recession. They need to say, hey, People have lost their jobs. People are not spending money. They're scared. There's been, you know, all kinds of problems. Banks are pulling back. We need to stimulate the economy. And the way they do that is they drastically slash interest rates and they put money into the system. And that can happen in different, different ways. So if they start buying bonds, for example, they buy back securities of different flavors. Um, when they buy that, they put money into the system. So it's called quantitative easing or easy monetary policy. And so they encourage banks to lend, they cut rates really low, and that stimulates investors to invest and businesses to invest in people and to create production to get us out of a recession. Well, when you're at a peak and you have high inflation, like we've had over the last couple of years, we see exactly the opposite. The Fed basically significantly increases rates. They start selling bonds and securities to bring money back into the treasury. And essentially that lowers the money supply. They discourage banks from lending. Banks tighten up. And so it slows down the economy. So if you have an extreme one way or the other, which is what happens in most market cycles, you have a clear peak, you have a drop off, the Fed reacts again. When you have those things, the tools, the, the tools that the Fed uses are pretty effective. And the central banks are able to get us out of a recession, for example, generally speaking, eight to 18 months. That's been about the average over the last several decades when we've had recessions is these tools get you know implemented pretty quickly and then they start bringing you know, GDP up. The problem happens and what we're seeing now, and I think we're going to see for, for some time, is that as the economy is slowing from the peak where we were clearly at, you know, before the Fed started raising rates and inflation went crazy, the Fed started to do everything they could to cool down the economy, take money out of the system, raise rates make banks not want to lend and try to slow things down. But what they what they get is then inflation still not down low enough, despite all of their tools, despite a year of you know massive rate increases. And the economy is slowing. So GDP is starting to come down. This is what I talk about when I say I think we're heading for a recession, if we're not already kind of there or in a rolling recession. So you have production coming down, but inflation is still a little bit high. And the real challenge for the Fed, it's much harder to get us out of stagflation, Michael, than it is to get us out of just inflation and an overheated economy or just a recession, because the tools needed to, to balance both of those things are completely opposite. So the Fed has to walk this very fine line and this very fine balance to say, how high can we take rates? How long can we keep them there? How, how long can we you know, pull money out of the system to slow down the economy without putting us into a very, very sharp and deep recession. And then once you're there, okay, 
Now we have a recession. We've got a quantitative ease. We've got a lower rates. We've got to put money in the system. But how do we do that without inflation rearing its ugly head again? And so they are in this really, they're trying to, you know, thread the needle in, in something that's very, very difficult to do, which is why the Fed historically has not had a soft landing. You know, they've always tipped us from, you know, peak to recession um, and they still can do so. But even, you know, as they figure out what's going to what's going to be the bigger risk is the is the risk in the banking system is the risk in you know commercial real estate, which I would say yes to both. Um, and and what if things, you know, really we have another financial crisis. If that happens, they have to stop worrying about inflation and get us out of you know, the crisis. And so I think essentially that they're going to be, you know, trying to walk this fine balance and try to get it right. We could go into a, a recession um, and then they're going to get us out. And then we still have inflation, you know, higher, the risk of higher inflation longer over time. And so I, I don't think that either one of those um, things completely goes away, either one of those risks, and that the Fed over the next several years is going to kind of have us in this stagnating, stagflationary environment. And it's just going to be kind of more of the same of what we're seeing today. And so that's what I'm preparing for. That's what I'm seeing. But also understanding that it's not as clear cut as the economy is going to stay like this. There are there are small, there are huge cycles, and then there are small little cycles. So we've mm -hmm. talked about secular cycles, which are these longer term um, economic conditions. And then we talk about cyclical cycles, which are shorter mm -hmm. term, less than 18 months. And so you can have these little bumps in the roads where you're, you know, high growth, high inflation, low growth, high unemployment, and they can kind of do this for a while rather than just this huge peak and trough. And so that's what I'm kind of expecting and preparing for. Yeah, thankfully, because again, I, I, have an, I have an econ degree and, and I remember, you know, we we kind of walked the line up to stagflation. We're like, okay, what does the Federal Reserve do if we have high inflation? And of course, Paul mm -hmm. Volcker was the topic we study. Okay, you raise rates to 18%, you break the back, you know, bingo, bingo, it's gone. This is all historical, all book you know, lectures and the like. And then they talk about, okay, what do we do when we're in a recession? We're kind of the exact opposite. You take rates really low, quantitative easing, you encourage lending and bingo, bango, we're out of it. And then I remember the the instructor getting the stagflation. Again, we're, I think I was a sophomore at this point. And, and we're, we're, and he's painting the picture of stagflation. And he basically took it to the, the, the students were, I don't know, 19, 20 years old or whatever we are. And it's like, okay, what do you do? And the, the 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 you know the problem is what do you do because if you lower rates inflation rages and if because the the tools don't work right you've got slow growth and high inflation and if you right. lower rates inflation goes up and if you lower if you raise rates it's 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 a problem I I would yeah. argue stagflation um, is scarier to the Fed than a recession what do you think of it? do you think that's fair. I do, because they know that their tools are not as sharp as they'd like them to be. You know, it's like trying to do surgery with, you know, I, I don't know, a chisel rather than a scalpel. And so, right. you know, when Powell continues to say it, it frustrates me because it is Fed speak. But when he continues to say, you know, we just don't, you know, we we don't know, like we're, we're data dependent. We're going to watch how things go. He's basically saying we really don't know. And, and yeah. it's not easy. And we we don't know all of the different things that could happen. They do at a high level that, you know, they're they're, econ you know, economists. Um, and so they they understand, you know, these things, but they understand that because of all these other things that are outside of their control, many things could happen that could change what they think is going to happen naturally, or as a result of the quantitative tightening that they've been doing, tightening the money supply and raising rates. And so, for example, Michael, you know, we're, and, and I'm very, very careful here, and I want to be very clear here, this is not a political statement for either party. I don't really care for either party completely, um, nor for all of our you know, candidates. But the reality is this, fiscal spending, what gets spent in Congress or through, you know, presidential, um, you know, I forget what they're what they're called executive orders. OK, so when spending happens at the federal government level, 
that really impacts what the Fed is trying to do. And so, yeah. for example, when you have the Fed trying to tighten everything to slow down inflation, but then you have Congress dumping a bunch <laughs> of money into the system like they have been spending yeah. like there's no tomorrow, you have what we call fiscal dominance. And what mm -hmm. that means is that while the Fed has dominated monetary policy and tried to get the economy building again, right? Not crashing into a deep recession, not stagnating. They're trying to create enough production to be higher than inflation, like we talked about. Um, but when the Fed, when when the Fed is doing that, and at the same time, Congress is saying, well, we, we don't like what you're doing. We're going to keep pumping money into the system to try to keep GDP high. They're going to, you know, spend a bunch of money at the government that puts money back in the system. And so it's it's kind of offsetting what the Fed is trying to do by still easing in some areas of the economy, which can make inflation go higher again, even though GDP yeah. is there. So that's just one example where we have fiscal dominance and both parties, um, both Republican and Democrat and oh, yeah. some independents in Congress are spending and agreeing to continue to grow the national debt and put money into the system. And so that's just one example where the it's outside the Fed's control and they're supposed to be apolitical. Um, you know, neither party says they love what Powell's doing, although they they know that he's trying to, to oh, do yeah. the right thing. Um, but that's just one example. Then you have things like, you know, what happened in, in the 70s and 80s. Not only do you have high inflation, but then you have wars and then you have oil crises. And so you know, having additional escalation uh, around the globe of, of conflict between countries that the United States has to spend money to help, you know, come to the come to their rescue to some extent, that is very potentially inflationary and causes government spending. Um, you look at oil, you know, how is oil going to continue to go up? And if it does, inflation comes back up. So these are just three things that are outside the Fed's control, that while they think they're on a good path of getting inflation down, they're they're nervous, right? As Pal talked about, you know, this morning a little bit in Congress and as he's talked about in his pressers, um, they really think they have a path to inflation coming down. But some of these other things are causing it to stay higher for longer and may cause them to keep rates higher, which is going to slow the economy, slow GDP while you still have inflation. And, and all of that is very stagflationary. But anything can happen, Michael. And that's what oh, yeah. I think the Fed understands is any of these things in and of themselves can cause a wrinkle in their plans. But if all three are happening, you know, oil issues, um, monetary, strong fiscal policy, putting money into the system or escalation of crises mm -hmm. around the country, potentially election fallout, internal conflict from all of that, all those things really rock the psyche of the country and and changes how they behave and the behavior of the consumer um, is just as you know impactful as monetary and fiscal policy. So, I I think they've got a huge challenge on their hands, and because of that, because of knowing that it's not as simple as you know, let's put us in a recession and let's get out of it quickly. It, it's not that simple. It's complicated. Mm -hmm. And so we have to kind of expect anything can happen. And that's one thing I've learned over time, especially over these last couple of years, is that everything is fine until it's not. And so you have mm -hmm. to plan for what could make it not fine. What risks does that present to me and my own income and my portfolio? And then how do I hedge some of those risks so that if they happen, I'm fine. And how do I prepare for some of those risks so that I can turn them in, into opportunities for me, especially when they only typically, you know, huge cycle changes typically only happen every seven to 20 years, somewhere in there, mm -hmm. you know, and they're getting closer and closer. We had 2001 and 2008, you know, 2020 pandemic, 2022, 2023. So, um, you know, we have to prepare for the unexpected, but we have to be able to say what's really happening Mm -hmm. How long could it take? And how do I not stagnate as an investor and just sit here 
and do nothing. You know, some some of you, it's better to do nothing, but continue to educate yourself and prepare. Um, but for most of us, we want to continually be looking for opportunity, looking for what we think could happen, and then figuring out how to not only mitigate, but, but capitalize on it. And so that's really yeah. where that's the perspective I try to take as I study these things um, and then say, OK, now now how do I take advantage, you know, like Blackstone just said, of a once in a ge generation opportunity when it does yeah. come? I think the I think the challenge for most people, including economists like myself, when you talk about stagflation being a, a real probability or, or possible is we're used to business cycles. Right. You said it earlier, right? Recessions, eight to 18 months. The 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 recovery or boom cycle, you know, six to 12 years. That's very kind of we understand how to operate there. Right. Stagflation. I mean, when I sit back about stagflation, I'm like, man, this could go on for years. Right. Yes. We're talking two, three, four years. Mm -hmm. We could be in this just kind of malaise. Uh, what do you think of that? For sure. And we've already kind of been there, you know, and this is where it's really difficult in the moment because the data, some of it's very lagging and a lot of it gets revised. So it's very difficult in the moment at any given time to say, are we in a recession or are we not? Um, is inflation on its way down or is it not? Because it, it's kind of all over the place. There's a lot of you know, factors, again, outside the Fed's control. But, um, you know, for example, we've talked about, are we in a rolling recession? Rolling recessions are very similar to a stagflationary environment. You just have these small cycles, these cyclical changes that are kind of rolling, while the, the overall cycle is just kind of stagnating. And so, you know, we had a quarter where almost all of the GDP growth, it was very um, shallow and it was almost all government spending all government, and a little yeah. bit of services, but manufacturing was down, industrial was down, housing clearly was down. And so you have these um, data points that seem very kind of bipolar, right? It's like, mm -hmm. are we or aren't we? And it's hard to tell where we are, but, you know, stagflation as a, as a longer term thing can have these like rolling recessions in them. And so it, it's hard to say, okay, this is it, like, we're really there until you see unemployment, you know, above four or 5%, then it's pretty clear, like, hello, here's your sign, right? We're in a yeah. recession. Um, but until then, until then, it, even if it's very, very shallow, it's kind of like the Magnificent Seven, you know, they're, they're starting to fall a little bit. But if you look at the breadth of the growth in the S&P, it's really been almost all the Magnificent Seven, maybe Magnificent Six now. And the vast majority of stocks have actually been underperforming. They have not been growing or they're falling. But when you look at it as a whole, it seems OK. And so I think that's part of, you know, stagflation is like it's it's this angst of, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Okay, how do we then react if, if we're really, you know, in a recession or if we're not? And I think that that kind of misses the point. I think we have to be very patient and realize that cycles can take a very long time to materialize. You know, you go back and look at and study 2008, 2009. I always reference it's 2009 because that's at the beginning of when AIG just about went over when it finally hit me that like I work at AIG, my 401k was just wiped out, layman is falling, et cetera. Some people say GFC started in 2008 and, and it did. Um, but even even before then, there were economists warning in 2006, hey, we're in a big real estate bubble. These variable yeah. loans, they're a problem. And a problem. everybody laughed at them. And they're like, yeah. you're crazy. Real estate's booming. You know, the, they were called the doomers of their day. And it took from early 2006 when a lot of when, when a few loud voices were warning of a real estate bubble. It took two to three years before it all suddenly happened. And so in that two to three years, there were those completely unaware that just kept buying and starting businesses and starting businesses at the height of the economy like I did, um, because I didn't understand that these things, there are real risks, but they take longer than than people expect. And so mm -hmm. you have to expect that that it seems to keep going. And then suddenly there's, there's a cliff yeah. or a change. And we don't know, you know, is it possible 
that the Fed has a soft landing, that we continue to produce while inflation stays higher. Yes, that but that soft landing, I would call stagflation. Um, and and I think that that's worse in some ways than a than a washout, a bottom and coming yeah. back because because we then know what to expect and, and know what to do. So we have to be patient, Michael. And I think that we're yeah. already two years in a, a year, at least a year the into year, yeah. Yeah. stagflationary type conditions. And yeah. I expect it to last another couple of years. Oof. With pockets of opportunity, pockets of deep recession and washout. For example, commercial real estate. If anyone doesn't think commercial real estate's in a recession, you're not looking, right? Like <laughs> exactly. values are down 20 to 40 percent, 40 percent in office across the board as of some stats this morning, 20 percent mm -hmm. commercial real estate overall. Um, the values have fallen. Transactions fell 70% in the last yep. year in commercial real estate. Um, and so, you know, and, and residential real estate, we've seen a recession in terms of transactions as well. And so there's pockets that are still doing well, certain areas of, of services, for example. Um, but, but we are in a deep recession when it comes to real estate. So part of stagflation, again, not just these little cycles where we can have some ups and downs where one leads the way versus the other, either more softening, more recessionary conditions or more inflation um, and expansionary conditions. We can also see sectors that within that mm -hmm. stagflation, you know, have ups and downs. And so we have to really study the economy and try to make heads or tails of it. And if if it's just too heady and you just don't get it, that's fine. Just understand that things may last kind of like they are now. And mm -hmm. you need to get really good at understanding your primary strategy and your primary asset class. And then watch where is that asset class more so than just where's the economy heading overall. If I own single family homes, right? What could happen with single family homes? What does stagflation look like? What does recession look like? What does a booming economy look like? And do I need to make adjustments to my single family home portfolio? Like this isn't the time if you don't have experience to go, oh, I'm a single family home investor. There's huge opportunity in commercial. So let's let me go become a commercial real estate investor. You can't understand the risks. And quite frankly, you probably don't have the cash needed to take advantage of some of those opportunities in a bank to actually give you, you know, that opportunity. But you can invest passively, maybe with a REIT like, you know, BlackRock. So um, I'm not, you know, advocating them in particular, but where there's huge opportunity right now in real estate is probably more so commercial than there is in residential, but you, you need to know what you're doing. And so, you know, be really good at your main thing, get the main thing, the main thing, prepare for how to, how to adjust your own portfolio that you run actively um, or that you asset manage and you have with a property management company, and then maybe divert and diversify some of your passive income into investing, you know, with the big guys who are going to take over, you know, these huge commercial deals. So that's, yeah. that's one thing that I think would be a tangible piece of advice uh, as to the, so what of all of this is keep doing what you're doing, get really good at understanding your market and your asset mm -hmm. class and then what the risks are to your market and asset class, and then where the opportunities are there. Yeah, I I love all of that. And one thing you brought up a little bit ago was the consumer, and you know that's that was always my chosen focus in economics, right? I was going to study the consumer and have for thirty years. It's going to be interesting to see how consumers behave in stagflation because we don't have a lot of data on what happens, right? We know when a big nasty recession comes, consumers pull back; they're scared. We know what happens when rates go down, they spend. What happens in stagflation where it's just like you're stuck in mud? What is going right. to happen? So um, we're going to be happy to watch the consumer. Yeah, for sure. And I, you know, I think that another thing that that makes it really kind of difficult to to time things is that we do have, and you and I've talked about this, um, you know, quite a bit on the show over the last year or so. But when we have these big shifts in the economy, like we've experienced, you know, post COVID, like we experienced in the GFC as well, you have widening wealth gaps, and so you know, your, your wealthier people or those that understand the economy and can kind of follow and track, you know, tend to make good investment decisions, while those that are not um, as savvy or don't have money to invest or they live check to check, 
they don't know what to do. And so they tend to lose net worth. They to choose to, you know, not be able to keep up with their expenses. Um, we've talked about this, but recently there was a new study that showed 80% now of American households live check to check, no matter what their income, even those that make 250 or more. And so, you know, when you have a consumer who has gone through a lot of changes since since COVID, um, ups and downs and ups and downs and, you know, waiting um, to see where things are going to have. When you have 80% of your population living check to check and can barely keep up with inflation, um, you do eventually have them go, okay, I have to start pulling back and live below my means because they just, it's too stressful not to do so. And so, you know, we're seeing that now. One, the, initially, anytime you have major change, initially there's denial. Like yep. I'm in denial that these bad things are happening and I'm not going to listen to anyone that says it is because they're a doomer and or I can't control it. So they get into to denial and then they go and what what have the American public been doing? They've been borrowing more money to keep up with their lifestyle. They're going into more credit card debt. Now we're starting to see large defaults on credit card debt. Um, they're, you know, they're borrowing, they're doing payday loans, you know, quick pay loans or doing multi-pay. Um, you know, I'm getting offers all the time. Would you like to pay this in installments instead of one time on your credit card or on whatever you purchase? And so, you know, we've seen that credit card debt has risen and now the credit card defaults are happening. The auto loan defaults are happening. We're starting to see an uptick, even with low interest rates in some residential real estate um, defaults or people behind on payments. And so I think when you have this kind of economy that's stagnating, you know, people aren't getting raises as easily as they were a year or two ago. Um, they're worried about, you know, layoffs to some extent and they're living check to check. They start to feel it. And eventually that denial goes into kind of like, okay, I'm accepting this is happening. And then they get depressed. Um, I mean, this is just part of, of human psychology. And then eventually they they just kind of, you know, throw their hands up or they just kind of get used to this is the new way of life. And they, they start to pull back on their spending. So I think that that is happening. I think it's going to continue to happen. But what's so confusing, Michael, is those in the top 20% who aren't living check to check, who are investing, who are growing wealthier, we're still spending because we yeah. can, you know, and that's, that doesn't mean that I don't have compassion for those 80% that lived check to check. I absolutely do. But there's a difference in an economy that's barely getting by because the top 20% are still going on vacations and going shopping and eating out. When the other bottom 80% stops doing that, it is going to continue to soften the economy to bring GDP down. Because GDP is something that a lot of people don't talk about. And I've really just started to really understand as I've listened to some, you know, older economists who've been around longer than I've been alive, quite frankly, um, that have a lot of wisdom to share. You know, we are looking at GDP and that's kind of this published headline number, but there's something in in a, in economics um, where GDP and GDI have to be equal. So GDI is gross domestic income. GDP is gross domestic product. So GDP is like, what, what are we selling, right? What's creating national production into the economy? But GDI is how much of that is, is going into increased incomes, you know, household incomes, business incomes, et cetera. And what we're seeing is though, even though GDP is technically just above inflation, so we're technically not in a recession if you're looking at just two quarters of negative GDP, what happens is GDP is up, let's say, 3% ballpark. It's mm -hmm. plus or minus a little bit. But GDI and GDP are supposed to always match because for everything you sell, it becomes income for someone else. So I create production, I create a sell, somebody's making more in income. But what we're seeing is while GDP is at three, give or take half a percent, GDI is down 1%. There is a four point gap right now between GDI and GDP, which means that it's not trickling into household incomes. And so when we talk about me believing that we're heading toward recession, if we're not already in it and it just hasn't been declared, um, I look at GDI. There has never been such a wide gap in GDP and GDI, and it's because GDP is very it's not telling the whole story when incomes start to come down. 
consumers quit spending as much money to your point, Michael. And so GDP, I believe, is going to follow because as incomes go down and people stop spending and they live check to check, they're, the, the GDP is going to come down. They're just not going to buy as much stuff. So sales and production is going to come down. And so mm-hmm. that leads me to thinking we could head just into a deep recession that gets us out of stagflation if sure. it stays. But if inflation rears its ugly head again, while while the Fed's trying to get us out of you know, um, recession and back into a producing economy, that's where we can have some, some stagflation. So the consumers rocked. They're going to continue to be rocked. Um, and those in the top 20% are the ones that are still keeping the economy afloat in, in my estimation. Well, let's talk, let's transition to crash up. This was first brought to me by the fed guy, um, uh, in an interview we did. And, and the whole idea is, you know, if the fed starts to do, you know, easy monetary policy cuts rates, we could see asset prices increase. And we, he and I had this conversation, I think almost a year ago now, And of course, as of today, I believe the S&P 500 is at or near all-time highs. We just saw Bitcoin hit an all-time high. I think it was yesterday. Uh, We have certainly no crash in residential real estate. I think it was up 5% last year, according to Case Schiller. And to your point about the 20%, the top 20% own most of the assets. And as we look at it today on March 6th, they're probably feeling pretty good. Yeah, you know, it's it's really interesting. Again, you know, just these lag these lag effects and consumer behavior because you can look at textbook, you know, what's happened in history and history it doesn't always repeat, but it definitely rhymes and mm-hmm. I'm a big fan as as you can see and as we we talk about you are too of looking at history and saying when these things happen what do the central banks and governments typically do? Where yes. does that lead? And then how do we use that knowledge to know when when to yep. know when to hold them, fold them, walk away, run, right? And yep, so yep. um, you know, basically we all are trying to figure out in time um the market and you mm-hmm. know, sell high, buy low, and and that's what everybody would love to do, which is why we like these huge peaks and troughs. When yep. you have stagnation, it's hard to see. But the other thing is. Um, a lot of it depends on the the behavior of the consumer. And I think I think that I'm not remiss to say that the behavior of the consumer has really surprised me post you know 2020 covid. Yeah, um, that's fair. but yep. some of it is is also at the same time kind of obvious human behavior. Like if I'm given a bunch of free money, I'm gonna do one of two things. Well, one of three things. I'm gonna be afraid. So I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to put it under the mattress or keep it in a checking account because I don't know what's going to happen post-COVID. Is the world going to fall apart? Is the U.S. going to lose its world reserve currency status? All the things that everybody's worried about. The second thing is people say, everything's going to hell in a handbasket, essentially. So let me enjoy while I've got the free money. And they Mm -hmm. go and they blow it on vacations. And we've seen this in the news. People got COVID money and they went on a vacation or they bought a bunch of stuff. And then they need it again and need rental assistance. And it's like, well, what happened to all the money you got? Well, they blew it. And I know a lot about poverty mentality because I grew up in poverty. And when you grow Mm -hmm. up in poverty and you never really have much and you can't get ahead, typically what happens, and it's a huge percentage, I don't remember the stat, Michael, but I believe it's over 90% of people in poverty stay in poverty the rest of their lives. And Mm. that poverty mentality kind of says, I rarely get enough money to enjoy the finer things in life. So the minute that I do, I'm going to go spend it and I'm going to have a little bit of joy by buying some stuff, you know, whether it's your new $200 pair of shoes that makes you feel good for a little bit, or it's the big TV, or it's a small vacation. They, they know that this time, this opportunity that they have a little extra money isn't going to last. And so they go spend it and they just hope that things will be okay. And that is a huge percentage of our population that just blows the money, right? You have the third percentage of the population, which is a much smaller percentage, which saves and invests it. And so, you know, we see that post-COVID, when all this money was deposited into our checking accounts, um, it kind of drove me crazy. It was the first time I thought, man, this is not going to, this is going to create inflation. I really thought that, you know, back then, because, you know, I, as a real estate investor, one of the benefits of real estate investing, which we love, is depreciation. So it wipes out our taxes. So the government says, hey, we don't want to provide housing to people. We're going to incentivize you to do it. So if you'll go create housing or create jobs, we'll give you big 
tax breaks. And so I was able to get my tax nut down to nothing. And for three years that I made more money than I'd ever made because of huge bonus depreciation on my commercial real estate. So it looked like I didn't really make money. And the Fed was dropping checks into my checking account for all my kids and me. And I'm like, I don't need that money. I don't want that money because someone's going to have to pay the piper. Right. Mm -hmm. But when they give so much money, you know, most people are going to go spend it. And then you're like, why are they spending money? The economy shut down. Well, that's what quantitative easing is supposed to do, whether it comes from Congress or the fiscal side or the Fed on the monetary side with easy, you know, easy money and easy um, loans to get. Eventually, that money is spent pretty quickly. You know, may maybe it takes a few months for some people, maybe a week, maybe a couple of years for other people. But when you then think, oh, well, now the economy's booming. I spent all that money, but now my wages are going up because we did have wage inflation. It was hard to find workers for anything less than, you know, 20, 25, 30 bucks an hour in a lot of cases for what, you know, used to be 12 or $15 an hour jobs. Now they're feeling really good because their wages are keeping up with what they think inflation is. So now they're spending, spending, spending again. Then suddenly it's like, okay, well now jobs aren't as plentiful and wages aren't keeping up and inflation is going higher. And I think that they're kind of in this yo-yo of things are bad. I've got money. I can spend it. Oh, things are good. I've got money. Mm -hmm. I can spend it. I'll charge it all now and hope things are going to keep being the same. So the consumer has behaved in some ways in a way that we would think, but because the economy is taking so long to finish doing what it, whatever it's going to do, I think people are really confused. And now I think that they are, they've spent so much money, 80% is check to check. They've got huge credit card debt. And I think it's just finally starting to hit people that inflation could be higher for longer, that we might have higher interest rates for longer. We can't cover our credit card debt. I think you're going to see an increase in bankruptcies, people just trying mm -hmm. to walk away from the debt. And no I doubt. think that as the recession rears its reg re ugly head and becomes more obvious and inflation, you know, maybe stagflation, both keep going at the same time. I think the consumer is finally going to capitulate and say, we have to stop spending. We're not in a good place. And that's going to slow the economy down. But a lot of it's human psychology. And, and mm -hmm. it's just, it's going to be interesting to see what people do. And if that top 20% is spending enough to keep things humming, even though the bottom 80% is really still struggling check to check for years. Yeah, it's, it's going to be, it's it's going going to be, be pretty interesting. Gonna... Let's, uh, let's switch to the closing segment opportunity, right? Again, we said earlier yeah. where there's great pain, there's great opportunity. When you look at, you know, what you are doing for you and your family versus your coaching students and all of that, where where are you kind of, where are you looking or where you might be pointing people at to to at least start doing the work and, and you know, get ready for the opportunities? Yeah, I, th I think a couple of different things, you know, again, I think it's really important to know yourself and where you are and what your financial goals are, because my financial goals at this place in my life might be very, very different than what your financial goals are where you are. So no matter how many people you listen to, how many episodes of our show, you know, you listen to, you really always need to come back to the fundamental question of what is your primary financial goal over the next year to yeah. five years before you even look out any further than that in the next year to five years, which is somewhat uncertain. What is the main thing that you and your family need to get through that period and to thrive? And so, you know, putting on my private banking hat from, you know, back when I worked at Bank of America and I talked to clients about their, their financials, I'd ask one of three things is your primary financial goal that you need more income. Is it that you want growth for the future? you know, huge net worth increases down the road, or is it that you're in preservation mode, that you need to preserve whatever you have? And in an economy like today, where there is a lot of risk, I do think that preservation becomes important, more so than in a growing economy, when you know you're at the bottom and you have years of appreciation to, to come, you can take advantage of a lot of opportunity. But when you're not yet clearly at the bottom, you need to be really careful with what you have and invest in things that are going to help you preserve your wealth while at the same time creating either growth or income, whatever your primary thing is. Once you're already at the bottom, then most of the risk is obvious. It's like handed to you, here's the risks, and this is what you need to do. You can make better decisions to seek more income or to seek more appreciation. The thing I love about real estate, um, one of the things that I love about real estate is it really has 
built in all three of those components. So most things that I can buy are going to preserve my wealth because they're usually not going to fall in value substantially. Now, what are we seeing in commercial? 20 to 40% drops in value seems staggering and it, and it is. And so it's possible you can lose value in real estate, uh, depending on what happens in the economy as we're seeing. But in residential real estate, as you and I've shown in the 50 year plus chart of, of real estate values, even in crazy economic times, you might have little blips, but Inflation adjusted real estate's gone up about a percent a year every year after inflation um, in just natural appreciation. So you've got some of that natural growth and appreciation. You've also got mortgage pay down, which builds equity. So that's another growth play. And you've got cash flow. Hopefully you're only buying, you know, not alligator properties, but properties that actually cash flow. And that's increasing your income. Plus you have tax benefits. And so it's got a great combination of all of those things. So, so I love real estate and I still prefer real estate over many, many other investments that I have less control of and that just have less of a history of generally going up in value, creating um, income and, and saving on your taxes, which puts more money back into your pocket. So real estate, I'm very bullish of um, whether it's residential or commercial. Um, the, the next thing is, OK, which one is going to be best for you? So if you really need income. Now, granted, there's there's risks here, as we've talked about on this show, but sometimes you can create more income by making something a short-term rental. So if you're in a market that is historically known for long-term income on short-term rentals, like it's top of mind for most people when they want to go vacation. So not your, not your house in a residential neighborhood 30 minutes off of Sarasota Beach. Like mm -hmm. people aren't going to go, let me go rent a house 30 minutes away from the beach. They're going to go, let me go buy, let me go rent a place on the beach or oceanfront, right? So mm -hmm. um, you're not going to find a little island that nobody can get to very easily without boats and planes and make a ton of money on it. So, you know, if you're going to be in short-term rentals, you have a potential to make a lot more income, but you also have some risk that if the economy continues to soften, people quit traveling because they can't afford it. And so your income could come down for a while. But if you've got enough savings to weather, you know, lean months or a lean year or two, and you really want income, short-term rentals in certain areas that are very profitable and historically um, need short-term rental income, that can be a very good play. You have to be really careful. So one of the things that I've done historically, and and not all of them have been winners, Michael. You you know you you make your bets, and economies change, and sometimes you know they don't work out as good as you planned, and you sell them or you keep them, you, you decide what you want to do. But when I have bought properties, I've only bought near water um, mm -hmm. because properties that are on a beach or on a lake or on a river historically are very highly rented as vacation rentals because when the economy is bad, people say, where can I go on vacation and make it cheap? We can eat yep. in, we can cook. And so you can go camp out, you can go to the beach, you can buy groceries and you can enjoy yourself without spending a ton of money. Um, and so look for areas like that where the town needs the short-term rental income, where they're not going to shut you down because of a bunch of hotels, but they need the tourism income. So that could be a play for some of you that want income. Just be very, very careful. Um, for some of you that really want growth over time, Time, but you're not so worried about income because your income needs are already met. Um, then go to areas in residential housing. There's we're we're very undersupplied in residential housing, um, where they're undersupplied, where you don't have huge REITs that came in and built you know 500 homes for build to rent. You want to be in areas where there's not a lot of single family homes, where you know that as people struggle for the next few years and they can't afford to buy a home they can afford to rent your home and that can give you some cash flow and give you some upside when the econ when real estate finally you know starts booming again which could take a, a few years where you still have some potential for real appreciation because of a lack of supply so that could be a good appreciation play uh, but again if you need income and you can't afford for it to be empty a month or two and and lose some money in cash, even though you're gaining equity from the mortgage pay down and natural appreciation, that wouldn't be a good play for you. 
Um, and then, you know, it's it, again, they're all kind of good preservation plays as long as you buy right. Um, for those that like commercial real estate and want huge opportunity, you know, most investors are going to need to partner up with other people or invest passively. And I can tell you, you know, I've been I've been working, I've been doing commercial real estate, you know, bigger than five units, 100 unit, 200 unit, 500 unit apartment buildings for about five, five and a half years at this point. Um, and before that, I was really mostly in residential, lots of small multi-units. Um, but I can tell you that even with even those who have a multi-million dollar net worth, who have 20, 30 years experience in real estate, the only people that are really going to be able to take huge advantage of deeply discounted commercial properties while they're low are those that generally have large funds and millions of dollars in cash. And the reason for that, not just millions, but tens and hundreds of millions of dollars in cash. Part of the reason for that is that banks that are distressed because of the commercial real estate values falling, when they have to take back those loans and they are ticking up, I think commercial real estate defaults are now at like 8.9 or 9.8%. So mm -hmm. especially in the office world, they're, they're bad and they're getting worse. Right now, this year, we have about 20% of commercial real estate. There's $5 trillion in commercial real estate loans estimated. 20% of that's coming due this year and another 20 or, or more next year. And for office, it's 25% are coming due this year. So they're having to refinance their debt because the debt's coming due for maturity at more than double their interest rate oftentimes and at values that are down 30 20 to 40 percent, 40 in office, let's say 20 to 30 in multifamily. So these banks are going to have, they can't refinance. So they're going to have to say, we're going to write down this asset. We're going to take it back. Commercial investors, non-recourse loans are going to hand back the keys. The banks are going to go, now we need to sell this. And they want to sell it for the loan amount. They might not take a huge haircut because a lot of them only lent 70%. So if it's down 30%, they might be even, but they're going to try to sell it to somebody who has deep pockets, or if they let yep. them take over the mortgage, Michael, they're going to have to have so much liquidity that they know they can get a 50% LTV loan, 50, yep. 60%. Banks are already at 60% on a new purchase. But if you're trying to take over something that's distressed, not cash flowing, highly vacant, the banks are not going to lend to anyone that's going to put a significant amount down because the banks are already worried about the loans they have on the books, much less taking on new loans. And so banks are tight. And so what that means is unless you have, again, millions and millions and millions, tens and hundreds of millions of dollars to pay you know, cash at or or fifty percent LTV, you're not going to be the ones. You know, the bottom eighty percent are not going to be the ones that take advantage of the big commercial real estate deals. So, my suggestion to you is that you um, look into some REITs that have been in business for decades that have have the cash that are going to take advantage of the commercial real estate loans. Listen, I'm a syndicator. I operate small apartment buildings. I say small up to four or 500 units. There's apartment complexes that are a thousand units, right? Mm -hmm. That some of these REITs might buy. Um, and if you can work with a syndicator who's developing a fund who has decades of experience, not three or four, not even five. Okay. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to say something here. I have five and a half years of major commercial experience and, and about 25 of real estate, 25 plus. Um, if I can find a great apartment complex, you know, 50% on the dollar, 60% on the dollar, and interest rates are good enough um, that I can make a profit for my investors, then I'll take advantage of that. And someone like me that's been at least in real estate for 25 years, understands the economy, you know, very pretty well off, you know, has a successful track record, fine, invest with them. But if your syndicator has only been in real estate for three to five years when things went really well, you need to be really careful. You you yeah. want to be investing with those that have 20 year track records, 30 year track records. And for the average investor, um, Keep your residential thing your main thing, and then go invest passively with big REITs like BlackRock, who are showing we know what's coming, we're prepared for it. Here's how we're going to profit, and they have a history of being able to do that. So, huge opportunity. But even though I'm an operator, Michael, I'm going to be investing some some of my money passively with some of these bigger REITs that I know are prepared to take it on without mm -hmm. me having to do all the work and, you know, raise hundreds of millions of dollars, which is really tough right now from individuals yeah. who are scared of commercial real estate. Yeah. On to this amazing conversation, stagflation, crash up and opportunity. Where can people find you? 
Great. You can find me here every week on your show, social media, Anna Kelly, Aria Mom. And for real estate coaching, consulting, and deal review advice, you can find me at AnnaKellyInvesting.com. Thank you so much.